Next Wave DV presents NAB 2013. Made possible by Kessler Crane, innovative tools for filmmakers. Red Rock Micro, introducing the one man crew. Zeiss, we make it visible. This is Sean with Next Wave DV. We're back at the Adobe booth and we're talking to Carl again, but this time we're going to be talking about the advancements in Premiere. So I've heard that, well obviously, Adobe, you're always trying to make new advancements, you're always improving on your products, so what are we looking at for um, upcoming improvements to Premiere? So we've really tried to listen to people as uh, the adoption of Premiere has been driven forward. Uh, more and more people are moving over to Premiere now. Um, we're really trying to listen to people and find all those little problems that any place where the software gets in the way of editorial work, we want to try and eliminate that. So a couple areas that we've really focused on. First off, you know, we've continued to kind of drive the, uh, the idea of being able to work natively with virtually any format. So I've got a timeline here that has everything from like old Hi8 footage from the 1980s all the way into R3D files from Red. So um, that ability to mix and match different clips on the timeline is still like a big part of what we do. And that's all real time, no rendering. Right? No you rendering. Have to render anything. Exactly. We've got effects on some of these clips. We've got some other things going on. And again, it's uh, no point do we have to render this out. Um, we uh, we've really focused on the timeline and looked at trying to improve just the viewing of the timeline inside of Premiere. Um, trying to make it a little bit more visual. Okay. So uh, in, in some cases this involved going back and looking at things that we were just missing, that uh, editors kind of expected to have and we didn't have access to before. So if I take the timeline panel here and just kind of blow this up full screen so that you can see the uh, number of tracks that we have here. I've got a number of uh, different ways now that I can actually adjust like the heights of the tracks as far as you know zooming in on a part of my timeline. We've made it much easier to kind of go in and you know really maximize the real estate and really see what's going on with each of the different tracks. Yeah, that's great because uh, as myself, I do a lot of the, uh, the audio uh, mastering at our mm -hmm. studio. And just because of workflow reasons, I do that a lot in Premiere. Okay. So being able to pull it up, you know, Having a better interface there would really help with just mastering audio too. Absolutely. Not only adding so many tracks of video. You can even create custom views and those can be keyboard uh, driven so wow. that you can actually come in and say, I just want to have an audio only view and it will hide all the video tracks for you and just give you an audio only view. Great. Wow. A video only view, um, the height of the individual tracks, you can customize that to a specific view that you want to be able to go back to and then assign that to a keyboard shortcut that you can use over. Wow, that would make it really fast. That's awesome. We've, uh, we've added um, the ability to show things like duplicate frames through edits. So these are just common things that people want to see. You know, I've got a couple of clips here where we've actually, somebody split this clip right here, you can see. And uh, this particular clip, you know, that, oops, that just has a, a through edit indicator on it. So it's possible to select the edit point now and join that back together again to get rid of an unwanted edit point. Great. Again, it's a small thing, but it's something that people. Well, expect there's to many have. times where I've wanted to do that just to keep it deep for when I have to go back into it later on. Definitely. So the other thing that we've also done is made the headers inside of Premiere Pro completely customizable. So in CS6, we introduced the idea of customizing the control buttons underneath the source and the program monitors. So we've created the same basic idea for the audio okay. and the video headers. So here I've got a copy of my audio header, header, and I've got this button editor. So this is where I can go in and I can pick and choose exactly what I want to uh, add or remove right. from the, uh, the header. So if I wanted to get rid of the track mixer, I could go ahead and do that, or I can add in the track mixer. And this is actually a new function specifically for audio. We now have the ability to have a track mixer in the header of each of the oh. different tracks, so you can see the audio on a track-by-track -track basis. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really happy about that. Now, talking about audio, um, Premiere has always had the ability to do automation, but we've added and improved on that functionality with this with uh, control service support. Right. And uh, we still have the ability to do track keyframing, where you can actually set up a series of keyframes in the track. Right on the track. But um, a lot of people were asking for the ability to do clip keyframing and automation. We only had okay. rubber banding before. We've now added a new clip audio mixer. So when I'm working with the clip audio mixer, this is actually creating, and I can automate the, uh, the slider here with uh, 
you know, the, the standard uh, latch touch write type of phenomenon. Right. And uh, I can go in and I can create uh, clip audio keyframes that will actually move with the clip if I move it around on the timeline. So again, right. someplace that we had to go, kind of go back and uh, make sure that we, uh, we had a feature people kind of expected. Um, some other areas that we have uh, kind of focused on, a lot of people like the idea of being able to do like a rough cut timeline or a timeline of selects, and they want to right. be able to load that up into the source monitor. So I still have the ability to take a timeline sequence and load it up over into uh, as a regular timeline, and I can still do selects and copy paste and things like that. But okay. if you really like having uh, the idea of using this as a flattened sequence, you can now open this in the source monitor. So here I have this entire timeline loaded up in the source monitor. I can mark an endpoint and I can mark an out point. Now, in CS6, I could paste this or insert or overwrite it to my timeline as a nested sequence. Right. But what we've added for this release is the ability to pick and choose which source clips we want to actually work with. So this little button right here in the interface actually allows me to choose whether I want to insert as a nest or whether I want to insert certain clips from certain tracks. So instead of nesting, you'd be able to pull those clips directly out of the sequence and insert them into the other sequence. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Okay. And you, using the new track targeting, which is vastly simplified from CS6, we can go in and actually pick and choose exactly which tracks that we want to work with. Uh, V6 through V8 are mostly adjustment layers in this timeline sequence, so I can okay. go ahead and turn those off. Just pull clips from V1, V3, V5. So uh, when I go in and I do, you know, an insert or an overwrite, I'm just getting the clips from those particular clip, or those particular tracks. Right. So uh, a lot, again, a lot about just standard uh, editorial work and making sure people feel comfortable working in the timeline. Yeah, those are great improvements. So a big area we focused on is color. Um, new inside of Premiere is the ability to use what we call Lumetri looks. So these are the looks from Speedgrade. And we now actually have the speed grade color engine, the Lumetri color engine is actually running live as a GPU accelerated effect inside of Premiere Pro. Now, if someone were to purchase just Premiere, are these included or do they also have to have speed grade to get this functionality? That's a good question. This is a function that uh, it doesn't require having speed grade even installed on the system. Right. So it uh, be accessible to anybody to do some simple color grading. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, the Lumetri looks, these are a special file format called a dot look format. And the dot look format starts as a LUT, um, but it adds a lot more information beyond that where you can actually do masking. Um, it can be a bunch of stacked layers, secondary layers. Um, can all be stacked inside of a .look file. Um, and it's possible within SpeedGrade to actually open up that look file and turn on and off those different layers. So these are uh, all the different presets that SpeedGrade ships with. Those are now actually part of uh, Premiere Pro and they're available in Premiere with these wonderful thumbnails so we can see exactly what's going on. We also have a special effect that is simply called Lumetri. And the Lumetri effect, if I drag this and I drop it onto a clip, it will ask me to select a look or any type of LUT file. This also supports uh, LUTs from other applications such as Resolve, Luster, um, other types of color grading tools. So you now have an easy way of adding LUTs to clips inside of Premiere. We really see this as a necessary thing in a lot of production work, especially as yeah. people are moving towards uh, you know, a lot of these cameras that shoot with a very washed out log right. look. Now you got more access to cheaper cinema cam cameras. I mean, yes. We shoot flat a lot, so being able to come make this more streamlined is a really big help for our productions. And just to jump outside of Premiere for a second, SpeedGrade's been re-engineered to really run well on laptops. So as far as having SpeedGrade on set to actually develop right. a look, um, you can then hand that off to the editor. He can throw it in an adjustment layer inside of Premiere. And as he or she is editing footage, that adjustment layer will just automatically be applied across the right. entire time. So you're minimizing your back and forth between the programs. Then. Exactly, without having to render new media, which is what we all want to avoid. Right. right? Um, we've also gone through and changed Premiere's uh, handling of audio plugins. So the nature of Premiere now, it, it supports uh, more VST3 plugins. Okay. And a lot of the plugins that used to only exist in Audition 
are now actually part of Premiere as well. Getting so. VST into Premiere is kind of always, I always had trouble. I, it mystified me a little bit. It's a hard process to, to do. Definitely. So uh, now if you go in and you look at the existing plugins, in a lot of cases, these have actually been uh, uh, greatly enhanced. They're newer plugins that have been added from uh, uh, from the world of uh, of Adobe Audition, okay, and a lot of these have uh, you know a, a nice new look to them. So if I add something, here's a multiband compressor. If I open this up, you can see that this is an Isotope plugin. I use that a lot, so yeah. So this is now built right into Premiere as well. Cool. And one of the big things that we've added, a lot of people have always said, I want to create a uh, a mezzanine codec workflow. A lot of people are used to this idea. Um, Avid DNX HD uh, with Apple ProRes has been the way of transcoding clips into a certain format and then outputting to that same format. Um, a lot of people have always asked, what is the Adobe mezzanine codec of choice? And since we've always really focused on native workflows, that's always been kind of a, well, what do you want to use type right. of answer. Um, we really wanted to expand on that because while we think native is the best way to go in a lot of workflows, if you have to work with other post facilities and you want to make sure that all of your assets are in a format that everybody on the planet can read, using a format like a ProRes or DNX HD makes the most sense. So um, rather than going out and creating our own we just went and licensed the best of breed out there. So we're excited to talk about, um, on the Mac, uh, ProRes, 64-bit ProRes is now built in for both ingest and export. Great. And uh, DNX HD is uh, built in on both Windows and Mac for import and export. So we don't have to go to Avid and grab that codec anymore, it's right in there. It's right in there, it's not dependent on QuickTime anymore, it's a native format. So in the Good. case of DNX HD, for example, we have wonderful new round trip workflows with Avid. So if you're starting in Media Composer or you want to finish in Media Composer, you can use uh, some of our improvements with the AAF format and the fact that we'll now support native uh, DNX HD OP Atom files directly into Premiere um, so that you can actually edit without having to rewrap files into QuickTime or do anything else fancy with your assets. That's great. So uh, we're, we're pretty excited about that. We're, workflows is a big part of what we want to do. You know, it's not just about selling a bunch of bunch of pieces of software in a box. We really want to try and make sure we have tools that interoperate with each other. No, that's great, especially in this world with uh, interconnectivity. You're working on so many different systems. Being able to have that is a great asset, especially Definitely. for the freelancer. Definitely. And speaking of the freelancer, one of the things we see in North America that's become more and more of a challenge for a freelancer is meeting government regulations for closed captioning. If you're yeah, an independent we're, we're dealing with that now, actually. Yeah. Really? Okay. We have taken the time now. We have a new workflow inside of Premiere itself that enables closed captioning workflows. So this meets both the needs of a broadcaster who maybe has a live, uh, something shot live that was captioned live. They now need to clean up the captions to meet the uh, specifications for rebroadcast. Um, new government regulations require that if you did a live caption and it was less than 100% accurate, you have to go up and uh, go back and actually clean that up okay. later on. So uh, we now have a new captions panel, and if you're working with captions layers, um, whether this is embedded in the asset to begin with, or whether you create a new captions layer, or you import an SCC or an MCC file, which are common formats right. for closed captioning, um, you now have the ability to edit the captions. Wow. You can see the captions live on the screen. So I've got two examples here. I've got the captions kind of burned into the video here. This is just sort of a test to see how the closed captionings match up with the open captions here. So we're kind of doing a just a sort of proof of concept to test this out. Um, but you can see here that each of the different captions actually has timing information from this new captions panel. Yeah. And when I choose to, uh, to export this, I'll go ahead and choose export media. In our export panel, we now have a, t an, a captions tab, and we can go in and we can actually choose whether we want to embed this in the output file or we want to create a separate sidecar file to hand off to a broadcaster okay. so that the broadcaster can know 100% that, okay, here's my video and audio media, here's my captioning media, now you have everything that you need to ingest into your media server. Are you also, are you also catering to uh, embedded flash? Uh, Procedures too, like you know, like the web is starting for certain things. You have to have those captioned too. Mm -hmm. So, will this support um, embedding that into a flash file too? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, this is kind of a 1.0 feature. Um, it took quite a bit of work to uh, make sure that we had 
know, the ingest of an existing file, existing asset, and be able to edit the uh, existing captions within that asset was uh, was a bit of engineering work. We see a lot of potential for growth with this. There's yeah. already a number of feature requests we're, we're seeing for people that want to see this. Um, I actually live in uh, part of the world, I live in Singapore, and so some of the standards for captioning is a bit different over there. Okay. And so people are excited to see this, but uh, it's probably going to be a few versions down the road before they'll start yeah. to use it in my region. I'm excited about it because uh, we've been looking into it before, and we have to basically um, contract out, you know, find a service that's going to go ahead and embed that. And you usually pass it on to the client, but still, being able to have the control over it is an exciting thing. Even this functionality is a huge step. Definitely, definitely. Pretty excited about it. All right. So that's uh, that's about everything with... Uh... Well, I do have one question for you, though. Sure. Uh, a lot of people have been saying this is like CS7. Uh, we don't know if this is a 6.5 or a 7 yet, do we? So at the show here, um, we are giving sneak peeks of the next generation of the software. Um, as far as what the naming is concerned, I'll leave that for the people back in San Jose. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Kyle. We appreciate right. your time. Thank you. Subscribe to Next Wave TV, where filmmakers get educated.